all these applications as to uh, this gal's status, I'm uh, in by inference. Right. I'm just like to introduce to all these applications as to this gal's status, I'm in by inference. Okay, go ahead. I'd like to introduce the court the case Kemp versus State. Okay, so but hold on, just so that it goes smoother going forward. Anytime you have case law for me, send it to me the night before. I'll be happy to read it overnight. I, now it's it's a little tough for me to read it all, but go ahead. Kemp versus State, Your Honor, just for the record, it's uh, four, four six fourths on the second one two three eight. Okay, the case uh, is on very specific facts or logical specifically the court found that let me do this i'm going to read it while you all are doing your opening statement is there another case you want me to read yes, go ahead and then we'll have discussion after your opening statements and before Ms. gal testifies it is Lewis. Okay, those are the two cases you want me to read? Yes, sir. State, do you have any cases that you want me to read? Um, no, you're right. Okay, uh, let's address the issue of the court interpreter. Madam interpreter, if you'll please come up. Um, I, I need you here at the podium where there's a, come on up all the way over here. Okay. All right, and you can speak into the microphone here. Oh, right there, right, there you go. Okay, um, and then our rules on masks, you can do, you can wear the mask if you want to. If you're vaccinated, you're free to take it off. Uh, if you're not vaccinated, the CDC encourages you to keep, keep it on. So up to you how you wish to proceed. Um, the first thing I need to do is swear you in. If you'll please raise your right hand. Well, I'll let Keisha do her job. Uh, Mandarin. Yes, I do. Uh, and do you swear the testimony you're going to give me is true and correct, so help you God? Yes. Okay, you can put your hand down. If you could state your name, please. Xiaoling Richards. Okay, Ms. Richards, which agency do you work for? Chile Interpreting. Like Chile, the country? Chile. Chile is. Oh, uh, can you spell it out? Agency. Got Chile it. It's S H I L E I. Got it. Interpreting. Okay. Um, and do you have any training or credentials as an interpreter? I'm a contracted federal court interpreter. Are you certified in the federal courts? Uh, they don't have a certification for Mandarin language. Okay. Uh, how often have you testified in federal court? Not testified, sorry. How often have you interpreted in federal court? Um, it, it varies. Um, I would say average maybe once a month. But how many times have you done how many it? Times? I, oh. I asked the question wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Um, you can ballpark it for me. Over a hundred, less than a hundred? Mm, probably less than a hundred. Oh. More than 50? Yes. More okay. Than. So somewhere between 50 and a hundred times you've interpreted in federal court Mandarin yes. to English. Excellent. Federal court, but I also interpreted for the state court actually more. Oh, even more than, than federal, that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and how did you learn Mandarin? Uh, Mandarin is my native language. Um, and how did you learn English? Well, I went to an English college in China. I've also been here for, well, I went to Australia. I left China in 1999. So, and they sort of speak English in Australia. It's a little yeah. different. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you and you've been living then in English speaking countries since 99? Since 1999. Yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, and have you received any special training in court interpreting? Yes, I participated in the um, orientation with the court interpreting, state court interpreting orientation. And I also um, taken the written exam, my passive written exam, 
and I was a registered state court intern for years, but then we have to continue to do it. And do you understand that the law requires you to interpret everything that the participants, the witness, I, what, everything that occurs in the courtroom? Yes, I do. All right. Um, and my last question for you is, uh, do, do, uh, are you from mainland China or from Taiwan? What, what Mandarin? I understand there may be some differences between the two. I'm told. I don't know if it's, that's accurate. That, that's correct. Um, I'm from mainland China. Okay. Excellent. State, do you have any questions for Ms. Richards? You need to speak into a microphone. The state would inquire. You, you were perfect. It was working. Oh, sorry. The state yeah. would inquire as to what province in mainland China? Okay. Guangdong province. Um, the state believes your honor has um, covered all the other educational and background and proficiency questions and would ask your honor that if there is a moment where there seems to be need for clarification that the that the interpreter does ask for such clarification inform the court and the parties. Sure, I'll tell her that in a moment. Does the defense have any questions for Ms. Richards? Okay, is there any objection by the state or the defense to Ms. Richards interpreting today for Ms. Gao, state? Given Jeopardy is attached, uh, the state can have no objection. If issues arise during the process, we will uh, address them court accordingly. Okay. Does the defense have any objections? No objections. Okay. Member, mics. I need you all speaking into mics. Okay. No objections. Thank you. Could we specifically have Mr. Calloway sworn in and have him specifically colloquy, not just as counsel for future? No. Now, there are some things that the, that the defense lawyers get to do as lawyers, and uh, these are decisions they get to make. I'm not going to call it him on every decision the defense makes for him. Uh, so, Ms. Richards, uh, the, the only uh, request I have of you is uh, I know you don't have any background in this case. So if something is asked and you're not exactly sure what's being asked or the witness answers in a way that you're not sure what she means, feel free to say, I need to, to clarify that. Please do, do not be shy about that at all. Um, I know it's very hard to interpret when you don't understand the context of the case because different phrases and different words can go either way. Uh, so that's all I ask. You understand? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Are we ready to proceed to bring the jury in? Yes. I'll take that as a yes. All right. Oh, they're still over there. All right. So at ease. <clears throat> A very, very, very quick one. You can use the jury room. Yeah, jury room. There you go. Right. And if you and if you and if it's into the mic, everybody will hear you. And I will just keep reminding you. <laughs> will speaking up loud enough be sufficient for direct examinations and other aspects, or do you always need to be standing at the podium and the mic? The louder you speak, the more leeway I'll give you to be away from a mic. Uh, but generally, you do need to be near a mic. And then uh, for the defense, just keep in mind when the blue is on, we can they can pick you up. So I know you all are speaking. Make sure it's not on if you don't want them to hear you. And it's not so much that we might hear you. It's the folks on Zoom or YouTube will hear you. So let me finish putting on the record, <laughs> there being no objection from either party and based on my colloquy of Ms. Richards, I find that she is competent and sufficiently trained to serve as an interpreter in this case, uh, even though she is not certified, uh, there have been efforts made by our interpretation office 
uh, to find a certified Mandarin interpreter. Uh, there is a due diligence log that I will be printing that they sent me of all the uh, agents of all the agencies that they spoke to and their and the inability to find a certified interpreter. And so, in light of the efforts that we made, um, I will allow Ms. Richards to serve as the interpreter in this case. And we will ask that she be sworn in front of the jury when the report testimony um, commences. We will. Yep. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. All right, everyone, please be seated. Good morning. Welcome back. Let me, let me have a good morning back. Thank you. Just want to make sure everybody's awake. Uh, I hope you had a good evening. Did anyone do any research about any of the issues in this case or any of the people involved? I see everyone shaking their head. Excellent. Thank you for following my instructions. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read you some preliminary instructions for this case. Then when I'm done, the lawyers will make their opening statements, and then we'll probably take a short little break, and then we will begin with testimony. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected and sworn as the jury to try the case of the state of Florida versus John Calloway. This is a criminal case. Mr. Calloway is charged with three counts of sexual battery and one count of kidnapping. I will explain the elements of these charges to you after all of the evidence has been presented. It is your responsibility to determine if the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that a crime has been committed and that the defendant is the person who committed the crime. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence or the lack of evidence and the law. It is my responsibility to decide which laws apply to this case and to explain those laws to you. It is your responsibility to decide what the facts of this case may be and to apply the law to those facts. Before we proceed further, it will be helpful if you understand how a trial is conducted. At the beginning of the trial, the lawyers have an opportunity, if they wish, to make an opening statement to you. The opening statement gives the lawyers a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during the trial. What the lawyers say is not evidence, and you are not to consider it as such. After the opening statements, witnesses will be called to testify under oath. They will be questioned first by the side that calls them, and then they will be cross-examined by the other side. Documents and other exhibits may also be introduced and, and produced as evidence. After all of the evidence has been presented, I will then instruct you on the law that is applicable to this case. After I do that, the lawyers will make their final arguments to you. After you have heard all of the evidence, my instruction on the law, and the arguments of the lawyers, then you will retire to the jury room to deliberate and decide and determine your verdict. You should not form any definite or fixed opinion on the merits of this case before that time, nor should you discuss this case amongst yourselves until I have sent you into the jury room with instructions that you can deliberate. In order to have a fair and lawful trial, there are rules that all jurors must follow. A basic rule is that the jurors must decide the case only on the evidence that is presented in this courtroom. You must not communicate with anyone, including friends and family members, about this case, the people and places involved, or your jury service. You must not disclose your thoughts about this case or ask for any advice on how to decide the case. To be clear, this rule means you must not use any electronic devices or computers to communicate about this case, including by tweeting, texting, blogging, emailing, or posting information on websites such as Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, or by any other means at all. And do not accept or send any messages to or from anyone about this case or about your jury service. You must also not do any research or look up words, names, maps, or anything else that may have anything to do with this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. 
I know many of you have cell phones or other electronic devices with you here in the courtroom. You may use these devices when we take breaks, but even then, do not use them to find out any information about this case or to communicate with anyone about this case. And of course, please do not take photographs, video recordings, or audio recordings of either the proceedings or your fellow jurors. And after every break, please recheck your phones, make sure they're either off or on vibrate. These rules are imposed because jurors must decide the case without, dis without distraction and only on the evidence presented in the courtroom. If you investigate, research, or make inquiries on your own outside of the courtroom, I have no way to make sure that the information you have obtained is proper for the case, and the parties have no opportunity to dispute or challenge the accuracy of what you have found. And that is contrary to our judicial system, which gives every party the right to ask questions about and to challenge evidence being considered against it and to present argument with respect to that evidence. An independent investigation by a juror unfairly and improperly prevents the parties from having that opportunity which our judicial system has promised them. If you become aware of any violation of these instructions or any other instruction I give during this trial, you must give me a note. You must tell me by giving a note to the bailiff. A juror who violates these restrictions jeopardizes the fairness of these proceedings and a mistrial could result, which means the entire trial process has to begin all over again. In every criminal proceeding, a defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. At no time is it the defendant's duty to prove his innocence. From the exercise of a defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference of guilt. And the fact that a defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your verdict in any manner whatsoever. The lawyers are trained in the rules of evidence and trial procedure. And it is their duty to make all objections that they feel are proper. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on the reason why it was made. And if I sustain the objection, you should not speculate on what might have occurred had the objection not been sustained or what the witness might have said if he or she had been permitted to answer. During the trial, we will take breaks. During these breaks, you must not discuss this case with anyone nor permit anyone to say anything in your presence about the case. If anyone attempts to say anything to you or in your presence about the case, please tell them you're on the jury trying the case and ask them to stop. If they persist, leave at once and report the matter to the bailiff who will then advise me. You will be the sole judges of the sufficiency of the evidence and the credibility of the witnesses. In determining the believability of the witnesses, you may properly consider the demeanor of the witness, their frankness, their intelligence, their interest, if any, in the outcome of this case, their means and opportunity to know the facts about which they testify, their ability to remember matters, whether they've made any prior inconsistent statements, and the reasonableness of their testimony in light of all of the evidence in the case. I will instruct you to disregard the consequences of any verdict and to lay aside any feelings of sympathy or prejudice in favor of or against either the state or the defense. Do not concern yourselves with the imposition of any sentence as that is solely my responsibility as the judge. You, ha you have been provided with a notepad and a pen for your use if you wish to take notes during the trial. Of course, you are not required to take notes. Any notes you take, however, will be for your personal use. You should not take them from the courtroom. During any breaks, the bailiff will take possession of your notes, and then they will be returned to you when we come back to the courtroom. After you have completed your deliberations, the bailiff will deliver your notes to me, and I will personally destroy them. No one will ever read your notes. If you do take notes, do not get so involved in note-taking that you become distracted from the proceedings. Your notes should be used only as aids to your memory. Whether or not you take notes, you should rely on your memory of the evidence and you should not be unduly influenced by the notes of other jurors. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than each juror's memory of the evidence. Those are all my initial instructions. Is the state ready to proceed with an opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Rome, you may begin when you're ready, sir. Good 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. My name is Joseph Rome. I represent the state of Florida. It's good to see you again after yesterday. Am I close enough to the microphone? Yes, sir. Yes, you are. Sorry, I'm too short to use the podium. And here. May it please the court. Dinah Gao gets off an Amtrak train at about eight o'clock at night on November 2nd, 2017. You'll learn that her legal name is Gao Xiuhua, but she goes by Dinah in English. She's a solo traveler from China who had been traveling around the United States for about two months by that point. And she's excited to spend some time in Key West, which she hears is just beautiful. An American man had messaged her on an app while she was in New York City. And they met up in person and seemed to get along fairly well. She doesn't know it at the time, but that man is the defendant sitting right here. They never talked about anything sexual, no kissing, nothing, nothing romantic. However, when he suggested that he was from Miami and could travel with her as far as Key West, she thought, great, it's much safer to travel with someone that she spent some time with and feels comfortable with than to go it alone in a country where she speaks the language, but not like a native speaker. Plus, he offered to pay for the train ticket she thought this was a little strange. She'd rather go by plane. It's a much quicker trip. But he said that he'd already purchased the ticket and that it, his own ticket and that it would be a good way for her to see the sights. So she thought, you know what? I'll accommodate him. That's fine. And it's not like she hadn't been paying for things for him. She had bought subway tickets, things of that nature. So it seemed reasonable. Now Amtrak doesn't go to Key West. So the plan was to stop over and spend some time in Miami in a hotel. You'll learn that on the train, a few red flags went up for her. Dinah notices that the man is using a different name than the one that, she gave, that he gave her. He told her his name was David, but she sees on the ticket, Eric. When they get to Miami, he insists that they go to his apartment in Brickell to plan before she can go to a hotel. And she doesn't know the area. She says, fine, but let's get a taxi. So instead of getting an Uber or a Lyft where you would put your address into your phone ahead of time, he gets a regular taxi and refuses to give the address. He only gives directions. So they get to the building, 1550 Brickell Avenue, apartment 506. And it's, it's nice, it's a nice building. And she's committed at this point. She doesn't have a hotel lined up yet. And you know she's just got off a 33 hour train ride. So she's willing to take a rest and she swallows her nervousness and he doubts and follows him up. You'll see the surveillance video of them walking into the building at about 8.26 PM. He insists that they go get some food. So they go to a Cuban restaurant a short walk away and you'll see them on the surveillance video again, walking out. And then a few minutes later, walking back in with bags of food. By this point, the defendant really is starting to act differently than before. And Dinah is growing a little more nervous. Back in the apartment, he starts eating. She asks him if she could have some hot water. In China, ice water is not very popular. Usually you have boiled water. You'll learn that for whatever reason, this sets him off. He starts getting physical. He starts questioning, why is she even there? He demands to know how old Dinah was because she looks significantly older than he thought she was in her photos online. Dinah tries to play it off as a joke, that it's not polite to ask a woman her age. That's when he hits her, across the face, hard. It draws blood. He asks her again, Hits her again. You'll learn that Dinah is shocked and tries to leave. But the defendant physically won't let her get out the door. You'll learn that he tells her, I spent all this money on you, so I get to fuck you. He orders her to shower, and he won't let her take her phone in with her to the bathroom. She goes into the bathroom and turns the water on, but doesn't get in the shower. At that point, she's just trying to figure out how to escape. 
and the panic is starting to set in physically into every part of her body. She changes her travel clothes and into pajamas. In China, people wear pajamas kind of like you wear sweatpants here. They're not just for sleeping. She bursts out of the bathroom, makes a run for the door. But the defendant catches her again before she can get out and hits her again. Only later does Dinah realize that some of her top teeth came loose. The defendant tells her, you're here in my place, that he spent money to bring her down here and that you belong to me. He chokes her until she almost runs out of breath. He drags her by the hair. He tells her, if you run, you're going to die. Just stay here and take care of me every day. He tells her, I will teach you how to be a good bitch. From that point on, she's afraid for her life. As you will learn, once the defendant has terrorized Dinah into compliance, he begins the sexual battery in earnest. You will learn that Dinah did not know what to do. She didn't want to be raped, but she doesn't want to die. She's alone, trapped in a stranger's apartment, thousands of miles from home, in a city that she wasn't familiar with. Her face hurt from the stripes. He pulls off her clothes. He puts a collar on her with a leash to prevent her from running. Eventually, the defendant feels comfortable enough with her that he pulls out a video camera, and starts filming her. We will see this video, and I'm gonna ask each one of you to look at it, despite what you may be feeling when you do, and make sure you look at the details of it very carefully. At that point that the video is taken, Dinah is already scared into compliance. She's not physically fighting back at that point. In the video, you can see him giving her commands and you'll see her unenthusiastic attempts to comply. You'll hear him order her to open her mouth and you'll see him put his erect penis in it. He chokes her with it. Pay attention to his hands, initially forcing her head down. You'll see the dead look of fear and resignation in her eyes. And you'll hear her trying to tell him that he's the one at fault. At some point, the defendant touches other parts of her body. You'll hear from DNA technicians who found the defendant's DNA on Dinah's anus, corroborating what Dinah will tell you. Eventually, the defendant falls asleep. Dinah can't sleep holding on to the leash. But as he falls asleep, his grip loosens. She thinks, now or never. She thinks about jumping out the window from the fifth floor. Instead, she inches out of the bed, little by little, towards the ground. She slowly makes her way across the floor to the door afraid that the jangling of the collar and the metal on it is going to wake up the defendant. She makes it to the door, unlocks it, gets out of the apartment, and immediately runs and screams for help. You're also gonna hear from Claudia Torres, one of the defendant's neighbors. Claudia had never met Gao Xiuhua. You will learn that she was woken up on November 3rd a little after 3 a.m. by a naked, screaming woman with a collar running into her apartment. Her apartment door hadn't been locked that night. She will tell you how after this woman ran in, she went and closed the door and locked it. She will tell you that immediately after she locks the door, she hears banging on it. The defendant is outside yelling for Dinah to come out. She will tell you that she looked into the peephole of her door and sees the defendant's face, which she recognizes as her neighbor. 
Claudia will tell you that Dinah was naked except for that collar, that she was terrified, screaming, crying, and could barely speak in English. She'll tell you that her friend who was over that night called 911. And you'll hear that 911 call. You'll learn that at this point, now that Dinah feels like she just might be safe, the gravity of what had just happened to her starts sinking in and her whole body starts shaking. You'll find out that once the police arrive, they take Dinah to Jackson Memorial Hospital where the medical staff examine her and take DNA samples. You'll learn that the defendant's action, that the, sorry, you'll learn that the police got a search warrant to enter the defendant's apartment, but he is already gone. You'll learn that the defendant's actions after Dinah escaped, Dinah escaped, were not what you would expect from someone who had just had consensual sex. Instead, you're going to see surveillance video of him leaving the building with a backpack and a suitcase at around 3.15 in the morning, only minutes after the 911 call and minutes before the police arrive on the scene. The police track the defendant down a few days later and arrest him. They confirm that his name is John Halloway. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you're going to learn that the defendant is charged with sexual battery and kidnapping. My colleagues and I are going to present you with evidence, extensive evidence, to show that the defendant, John Calloway, is guilty of each one of those counts. And when we talk about a sexual battery, we think about rape, we think about penetration, but the legal definition is more specific. It can also just be mere contact between sexual organs. Penetration is not required in every circumstance. And we're gonna show you evidence that the defendant committed sexual battery on Dinah. There is video very clearly showing that there's penetration of his penis into her mouth. And we're gonna show you DNA evidence from samples collected on other parts of her body. At no point was any of this done with even a hint of consent. You'll see in the video that Dinah isn't physically fighting him off, but being coerced by threats and physical violence does not amount to consent. Dinah did not want to have sex with him, told him she did not want to have sex with him, and asked to leave the apartment and tried to do so by physically running. In fact, you'll learn that the permanent damage to her upper teeth is the result of the defendant's actions towards her to keep her in that apartment. And that's why the defendant also committed a kidnapping. You're going to see that the defendant trapped Dinah in the apartment. He hit her when, he tried to, when she tried to leave. He kept her from a phone or any other way to call for help. He used force and the threat of force and threatened to use more. The evidence will show that the defendant trapped Dinah in his apartment for the ultimate purpose of sexually abusing her, specifically for committing sexual battery. By the time he brings her to the apartment and locks the door, he had made up his mind about what he was going to do. Simply stated, trapping her in the apartment made it easier for the defendant to control her actions because it cut her off from the outside world and any hope of help. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you heard a lot about the state's burden of proof yesterday during jury selection. As the state, we embrace our burden of proof. At the end of this trial, after you have had the opportunity to hear all the evidence, I am confident that the state will have met its burden of proof and will show that the defendant is guilty beyond any possible reasonable doubt. At the end of this trial, my colleagues and I will come before you and ask you to deliver the only verdict consistent with the evidence and demanded by law, a verdict of guilty on all counts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rome. All right, Mr. John, you may begin when you're ready.
Yes. You may proceed when you're ready. Good morning, everyone. Members of the jury, in the fall of 2017, Dinah Gao was not a victim. Dinah Gao was in pursuit. She was in pursuit of money, stability, a means to remain in this country for as long as she could. She was looking for that opportunity and she found it. His name, John Callaway. You're gonna learn that Ms. Yao was in the United States on a visa and that her time was running out. That she was making her way across the country, city to city, spending short periods at a time. And all the while, was communicating online with perfect strangers, like Mr. Callaway. And Mr. Callaway caught her eye. She saw that Mr. Callaway had an apartment on Ripple. They had been communicating for about a week. He had nice things, and he seemed to be living that life that she desperately wanted for herself. And so she agreed to meet with him. And they did meet up in New York. Mr. Callaway would travel from Miami to New York to meet with him. You're going to learn the evidence that they spent several days together in New York, going out to eat, taking in the sights, all of Mr. Callaway's expense. And you're going to learn that Miss Gal agreed to travel back from New York to Miami with Mr. Callaway. You'll learn that Mr. Callaway purchased two train tickets for them. And for Miss Gal, she's going to tell you that. Once she gets on the train, she is gripped from that moment of fear. You just heard from the state. She goes through his belongings and observes a ticket, train ticket, with an alternate destination with a different name on it, a name she doesn't recognize. Ms. Gow is going to tell you from that moment from New York all the way to Miami, she's in fear for her life. From Mr. She's going to tell you that when she gets to the station in Miami, she still worked with that family. That when they get in the cab together, she still with it. When they arrive at his apartment, not only is she in fear, but she feels like she's being forced to do whatever he says from that moment. What you won't hear is any allegation that Mr. Galloway, Mr. Calloway forced Ms. Galloway onto that train, that he threatened her while they were on it, that he restrained her in any way, that when they got to Miami, that he held her, dragged her to the taxi cab. You'll learn that Miss Gow is the one who told Mr. Calloway to get the cab for them. You'll also learn that at no point on this journey, where Miss Gow was telling she was here from the mind, from Mr. Calloway, she never tells him that. She never asks him about the ticket. Why does he have it? Who's it for? Who's there? She never reaches out to any of the employees on the train and asks them, hey, listen, I'm in fear over here. This guy gets a ticket. I don't recognize it. I need help. Never happens. When she gets to Miami, she doesn't grab her luggage and take off. Go to her hotel. Go to her hotel. She hasn't booked the hotel. Her intention is to stay with him when they get to Miami. She knows he has an apartment out there. When they get off the cab, she doesn't tell the cab driver, this is on the first part of life. I don't want to go to the apartment. She goes up with him, and she's going to tell you why. She's going to tell you why she never reaches out to anybody on that train. She's going to tell you why she never took off when she got to Miami. She's going to tell you why she decided to go up to his apartment. Because she wanted to see his apartment. And she was interested in renting the apartment from him. As she's in fear of her life from him. That's what she's going to tell you. And you're going to have to evaluate if that makes sense. It will be up to you to weigh that credibility we're talking about. This Conflicts in the evidence, remember that. We talked about that yesterday. You'll be responsible for evaluating that. You'll hear that once they drop off Ms. Gow's luggage and Mr. Calvary's apartment, they go out to eat together, downtown Britain, without incident. Again, she's still fearful and comfortable with him. Doesn't tell him about it. He buys them food. 
They go back to his apartment. And it's at that point that Yahweh will tell you that her ordeal supposedly begins. She's going to tell you that Mr. Calloway demanded sex from her at that point. That he orders her into the bathroom to take a shower before her. And she complies. She goes into the bathroom. She does turn the water on to make me think that she's being a scout, but she doesn't do so. She doesn't just think about the escape as a stage. She actually attempts to escape the bathroom window. And she tries it, but it's too small. She has to go back outside. It's a compelling moment in her story. There's just one problem with it. You're going to learn there is no window here. In Mr. Calloway's bathroom. We've looked for pictures. Have them show you proof of that. Mike, Mike, stay near the mic. Thank you. Have them show you proof of that. I'm going to pass these pictures around. We've looked for pictures. Yeah, mind you, there is no window in the And you will be left to determine. No, no, no. No, don't pass them out. They're not in evidence. You can display them now. So you are. Thank you. You'll have an opportunity to look at those when they're in evidence. But you will be left to determine whether or not that makes sense or why she said it. Why? Why look at that story? This guy will tell you that when she comes out of the bathroom, she's forced to perform sexual acts with Mr. Calvin. She'll tell you that when she resists, when she complains, he beats her, hits her repeatedly in the face. You'll have an opportunity to look at this one as well. This picture is taken shortly after when he's got a message for her beaten in the face by a grown man. Conflicts in the evidence, you will be left to weigh that. Beyond the two exclusions of all reasonable doubt, that's the standard of the work. Ms. Gow will tell you that after she's forced to perform with Mr. Calloway, at some point he falls asleep. And she uses that opportunity to sneak away. He'll tell you that she leaves out of the apartment and runs to the neighbor as Mr. Calloway sleeps. But what you'll find is that that doesn't line up with the actual evidence that's going to be presented. Mr. Calloway does fall asleep after they consensually engage in sexual activity. But he isn't woken up when she walks out of the apartment. He's woken up because the scout has slept out of his room and is going through his belongings. He comes out to find her going through his money. And there is argument. Claudia Torres, the neighbor they talk about, is going to tell you she can hear. She's woken up by arguing. There is doubt. And at that moment, Ms. Gao, who's in a country that's not her own, but which she desperately wants to remain in, is now confronted with being accused of a crime. Yes, specifically. And she makes a decision in that moment. Again, she does leave the apartment. She's no longer welcomed by Mr. Calloway. And there is no hotel. There are no hotel reservations. She doesn't have the means. She does run. Out, and she accuses Mr. Calloway before he can accuse her. Mr. Calloway does follow. He just walked in on her room. And yes, Mr. Calloway later will leave that apartment. There's no dispute about that. Mr. Calloway takes a bag. He doesn't jump the border to Mexico. He doesn't go to the Cayman Islands. He goes to winter and visits an old girlfriend and her family. But more importantly, 
He leaves because he understands something. No matter what he's going to say in that moment, as this woman is across the campus, a naked woman just ran out of his apartment in the street. He knows in that moment, no one's going to hear about what happened regarding her sleeping home. She screamed, naked. You'll learn that Mr. Calloway is arrested in the street. And you'll also learn that from the moment that Ms. Gow walks into that neighbor's apartment and makes that first accusation, that false accusation, she has been housed, clothed, fed, and allowed to remain in this country every day since for almost four years. Directly related to her status as a cooperating alleged victim in this case. The state will bring you certain testimony from various witnesses. One of them will be Susanna Agamante. You've heard about her in the state's open. Ms. Agamante is a nurse with the Great Tribune Center, and she makes findings in this case. Specifically, she comes in to tell you that what Ms. Gao says from a clinical standpoint is true that she was sexually assaulted. Here's what Ms. Agramonte is going to have to admit to you, though that among her findings are conflicts on critical issues in the space, like their allegation that there was penetration of the vagina in this case, penetration of the anus. Ms. Gao herself does not allege. It's in the rape treatment center's findings, but Ms. Agramonte finds that she was. And when she's asked about it, she's going to have to admit to you she doesn't know why she made that comment. Doesn't know. I can't remember, but doesn't know. Ms. Gow is going to make allegations that she fought back against Mr. Powell, resisting and scratching and employing There's no evidence in this case. Something that the Rock the Great Treatment Center does, but didn't do in this case. You'll hear from Ms. Agamonte when asked why it wasn't done. She doesn't know. Lack of evidence. Conflicts within the evidence. Beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. The state will bring in other witnesses, various witnesses, primarily to affirm things that are not in dispute. They'll bring in a toxicologist, Lisa Reed, who will tell you that Ms. Dow wasn't under the influence of any drugs. Yeah, we agree. He didn't drug her, she was there consensually. There'll be technicians who will come in here to tell you about DNA on her body, DNA on his body. We agree. No dispute about that. They didn't engage in sex. You'll see the video that's been much alluded to in this case. And on that video, you will see two people engaged in sexual activity. You will see fellatio. You will see Mr. Calvin giving commands. But you won't see on that video, as the state says, is any resistance. You won't hear Ms. Gallup telling, no, I don't want to do this. None of that. What you will hear her say is, I'm yours. You will have to decide whether what you see with your own eyes constitutes an assault or two consenting adults engaging in a fetish. In kinky sex, might be uncomfortable for some, but it's done by many. You will have to determine whether the evidence supports the allegations in this case. You'll have to weigh those allegations against Ms. Gow's credibility. You'll hear testimony regarding more lack of evidence. DNA tests done in Mr. 
Callaway's apartment where they don't find certain DNA residue. Lack of evidence. We'll hear from Donald Biles, the victim advocate at the Rape Treatment Center. Both she and Ms. Agramonte will speak to you about certain observations they made about Ms. Gallup. They'll tell you the remarks from Ms. Gallup's next. And the state will frame it. But what Ms. Biles and Ms. Agramonte will have to admit to you is they can't be sure she was wearing a collar during unconventional sex. They'll tell you that her mouth was bleeding. Ms. Agramonte will have to tell you she can't be sure when that exactly what the injury is or when it occurred. Where it's from. That's a point for specialists. Who's going to come and talk to you about it? Conflicts in the evidence. They all the allegations in this case against the backdrop of an alleged victim who has incentive to continue to perpetuate the state theory in this case. The very ability to sustain those problems State lay out their cross in that. What you'll note though is that at no point was Ms. Gao ever unable to leave that apartment. She isn't chained to a bed, she isn't locked in a closet, any of those things. The leash that she's wearing on the collar is detachable. We've taken it off anytime we see what happens. She leaves out the front door of the apartment. You will have to weigh every inconsistency in this house testimony and determine for yourselves whether it lines up with the evidence. Why is she making a story about the bathroom? If she's in fear for her life, why would she go to his apartment and his Seeking a rental of real estate for even credit explanation. She'll tell you that when she first saw Mr. Callaway, she believed he was a criminal. Running for a week and agreed to travel with him across the East Coast. Does any of that make sense? And if at the end it doesn't, if you waver, on any aspect of the state's evidence in this case, it's reasonable doubt. That's your standard. And we believe that will be your finding. For that reason, we ask that you turn the only just verdict in this case. Not guilty. Okay, hey, thank you, Mr. John. All right, we're going to take a short recess. Uh, Ramel's going to take you over to the courtroom where you'll be deliberating. I guess they were already in there, right? Okay, so you're already familiar with it. Please don't discuss the case. You can take your notes with you over there, and you'll be back in about 10 minutes. There's water over there. There's a restroom that you can use. All right. Right, please be seated. All right, Mr. John, you may make your argument. Sorry? I've read the two cases. Oh, I'm sorry. ready for any argument you want to make. Yes, sir. As I said, in, in Kent, in Kent the, while the facts are different, the logic is different. The court found in that case that evidence of virginity was not uh, relevant uh, 
to any aspect of that piece. So that piece dealt with the consent. It's the same thing here. Uh, the state is offering these evidence to demonstrate uh, that because she was a virgin, because her hymen was a cat, uh, she would not have consented to any of the acts or would be less likely to consent to any of the acts in this case. It's not relevant to anything about that. Um, it should be kept out. Okay. State, anything you wish to say? Yes, sir. I think we reviewed the two cases cited by the defense. Uh, Kempe State uh, repeatedly says that it stands for the proposition. I'm sorry, I'm asking a lot of that. I think you are, but nevertheless, get the mic closer to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that the rape shield law is, in the end, a relevancy test. It is whether or not the information being offered is more probative than prejudicial. Um, Lewis is not on point at all. It speaks to the ability to question sex with her boyfriend as a motive to lie, and that's it's not it's not on point. Um, in this case, the state holds that the relevancy of the information is is far greater than the prejudicial the prejudicial weight. The defendant has just made his opening statement, which is based <clears throat> solely on the idea that Miss Gao is. Traveling the country, having people pay her way in order to in order to uh, stay in the United States. The evidence does not support this. We have we have here not discussion about previous sexual activity, but physical evidence um, of sex of, of a lack of sexual activity. Uh, further, Your Honor, and I apologize for only just finding this, but while I was reading the defendant's cases, I found Portillo v. State which is 211 Southern 3D 1135. That is out of the third district in 2017. And it is very clear that the rape shield does not, uh, is not used by both parties. The rape shield does not prevent the state from admitting evidence. Uh, the quote is, The rape shield law cannot be invoked by defendant to limit victims' direct testimony because the legislative intent in enacting the law was to shield the victim from abuse of conduct by the defense. The purpose of the rape shield law was to protect the victim's privacy from unwanted public intrusion, not the defendant's. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I, I will. Yeah. If your honor wants to offer a proof of what the state believes the victim will testify, um, if shown the video, if shown the video and asked whether or not she had consensual sex, her answer will be, and I believe it was elicited in defense counsel's deposition, and there's no reason to believe there's any answer contrary to this, is no, that she is a, um, I don't think it's a pure, I don't think the translation she uses is pure, but a good woman, that that is not something she's, she engages in. There's no evidence to suggest that she's ever had oral sex, anal sex, or vaginal sex with anyone in the history of ever. We filed the rape shield law to protect the victim from improper intrusions into that because of the defense theory and the defense allegations that are baseless um, as far as the record is known. Okay, Mr. John. Just move the mic towards you, Mr. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wasn't that to suggest she was having sex with him? She suggested she selected Mr. Calvin from that, from those efforts. But more importantly, Your Honor, what the state's argument, our argument is not that the rape shield Wait, I'm sorry. Lost. It's too much noise. <laughs> Thank um, you. Go ahead. Our argument is not that the rape shield law is being invoked by the defense law. What we're saying is a relevance argument. They are making the inverse argument for which the rape shield was designed to protect specifically. They want to introduce evidence of her virginity as a measure of her both sexual past and how that sexual past would influence specifically uh, the interaction that she had with Mr. Calloway. It's the same argument, just on the other side of the world. She's a virgin, so she wouldn't, because of her past sexual history, you should infer she wouldn't have engaged in certain sexual acts now. Uh, uh, as a relevance argument, there's, there's no bearing on that. There's no reason for that to come in uh, under the same logic. Uh, so the logic governing the, the rape shield law, it bears no reference on decisions made in this specific case that has been Okay. Promiscuous 100 days out of the year, but on 101, she decided to say no. She may be not promiscuous 100 days out of the year. 
on the foot, she decided this is what was Okay. All right. So I do find that the rape shield law is, in fact, uh, really just as the courts have said repeatedly, a codification of the relevance rule. So the real question is, is there relevance to the testimony that Ms. Gao, um, she can tell, her testimony will be that she's a virgin. The doctors or the, the folks from the hospital, they will only testify that her hymen is intact. I, I do find that testimony to be relevant. Um, the Portillo case just sort of pushes me more over the edge. Uh, and in doing a 403 analysis, I do not see the prejudice to the defense of that testimony. I certainly don't see any unduly prejudicial effect of that testimony. So at uh, this time, the, the, motion, the order of tennis motion in limine to prevent, and I know you didn't want to do this, but just in case, to prevent the doctors from testifying their hymen is in, intact is denied. And more to the point, to prevent Ms. Gao from testifying that she's a virgin, that request is denied. Anything else before we bring the jury back in? Just a moment. Of course. Anything else from the defense before I bring the jury back in? <laughs> no, because we don't have a digital court reporting. That's tied to the digital court reporting. And that clock is accurate. The one up there is accurate. Yeah. You can start bringing it back in. Unless, does anyone need a break? Oh, I can't stop that phone from ringing. Oh, but it was only one ring. Nobody needs a break. No, nope. sure. If you need, yeah, that's why I'm asking. We already got them out of the room. So, Mr. Calloway, uh, do you need a bathroom break? Okay, because you're going to be stuck there for about two hours. Our next break is about two hours away. So, okay. All right. I'll be right back.
All right, welcome back, folks. We're ready to continue. State, call your first witness. Um, yes, Your Honor. Before the state calls a person witness at this time, um, we just file our notice. Um, this is for certification state. Also, I'm going to deposit a state's 1A. Business record certification from this department, as well as one C. Okay. Any um, are you moving it into evidence? State offers into evidence. Absolutely. Okay. Any objection? Um, okay. Let's have a sidebar. No, I, I we need to do it all the way over there. Sorry, Gail. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Uh, we have a little hiccup. It's gonna be about another six or seven minutes and then we'll bring you back. I need you all to step out again. I promise we're gonna start going smoother than this. Okay, go ahead and play it and I'll be back. Starting the Friday, November 3rd, 2017, 0, 3 hours, 15 minutes, 34 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, any objections to the 911? Okay, I'll need you to say it again in front of the jury, but I just wanted to know if there were any issues. Okay, I already told Ramel to bring them back in. They should be in in a moment. Uh, Mr. John, if you'll let Mr. Calloway's parents know when, oh, I guess they can probably hear me, <laughs> when uh, I'm going to stop the live stream in order to, the YouTube live stream, when Ms. Gal takes a stand, in order to restart the live stream, I have to end the Zoom meeting. 
uh, and then restart it. But when, when I end the Zoom meeting, they can just switch to YouTube at that point because then everything will be on YouTube. You talk about once the uh, testimony is done. Yes, right. Yeah, no, they're, totally they're fine. They're in here. They'll be able to listen and watch everything that's going on. Yes, Yeah, ready. All right. All right, everyone, please be seated. I think we're ready to proceed at this time. Does the defense have any objections to, introduction in, to the introduction of the exhibit? No. Thank you. All right, the exhibit comes into evidence as State's Exhibit 1. At this time, the state will be publishing the evidence. Uh, one from the uh, City of Miami Police Department case number 17110300429. Okay. Starting date Friday, November 3rd, 2017, zero, 03 hours, 15 minutes, 34 seconds. Court exhibit. Court exhibit. Uh, it's uh, one five five zero. Uh, Okay. 
State, call your first witness. At this time, the state calls the victim, Gao Xiuhua. Right, and if I could have the interpreter come forward, please. Right, Madam Clerk, if you could please swear in the interpreter. Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. And you're Ms. Richards, correct? Yes, Shaolin Richards. Okay, thank you. Uh, she can come in. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, I'm guessing, but maybe you took some in school or in college or high school that none of you speak Mandarin, but if you do, you must rely on the English translation um, and, and not on what you think you've heard in uh, Mandarin, all right? Okay, Ms. Galv, you'll please come forward to be sworn in. Good morning. You can go stand next to her. Thank you. 
Okay, you can come forward uh, to watch out. There's cables down there. You can put your hand down. Okay. With regards to the mask, you can keep it on or take it off. It's up to you. And then you can have a seat here. There's a. Okay, I'll take one mask for everybody to Okay, I have a clear mask I can give you if you would like one. Uh, Ramel, can you get us one of the clear masks, please? They're in my, uh, in, in my office. Um, you can have a seat. Be careful, there's a step down there. And then there's some warm water there. Oh, we have them? Oh, never mind. Here you are, Ms. Gap. You're, you can wear that if you'd like. Thank you, Ramel. I, I meant instead of your regular mask, but you can do whichever you prefer. It's whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, okay. Up to you. I will tell you you're closest to me and I have been vaccinated. I don't know about the interpreter. Uh, okay. 